This is a recording of the Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. Chapter 5 There were moments of waiting, the youth thought of the village street at home, before the arrival of the circus parade on a day in the spring. He remembered how he had stood a small, thrillful boy, prepared to follow the dingy lady upon the white horse, or the band and its faded chariot. He saw the yellow road, the lines of expectant people, and the sober houses. He particularly remembered an old fellow who used to sit upon a cracker box in full front of the store, and feigned to despise such exhibitions. A thousand detail of color and form surged in his mind. The old fellow upon the cracker box appeared in middle prominence. Someone cried, Here they come! There was a rustling and muttering among the men. They displayed a feverish desire to have every possible cartridge ready to their hands. The boxes were pulled around into various positions and adjusted with great care. It was as if 700 new bonnets were being tried on. The tall soldier, having prepared his rifle, produced a red handkerchief of some kind. He was engaged in knitting it about his throat with exquisite attention to its position. When the cry was repeated up and down the line in a muffled roar of sound, Here they come! Here they come! Gun locks click. Across the smoke-infested fields came a brown swarm of running men who were giving shrill yells. They came on, stooping and swinging their rifles at all angles. A flag tilted forward, spent near the front. As he caught sight of them, the youth was momentarily startled by a thought that perhaps his gun was not loaded. He stood trying to rally his faltering intellect so that he might recollect the moment when he had loaded, but he could not. A hatless general pulled his dripping horse to a stand near the colonel of the 304th. He shook his fist in the other's face. You've got to hold him back, he shouted savagely. You've got to hold him back. In his agitation, the colonel began to stammer. Oh, 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 all right, General. All right. By God, we we'll we'll do our we'll we'll do 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 our best, General. The General made a passionate gesture and galloped away. The Colonel, perchance to relieve his feelings, began to scold like a wet parrot. The youth, turning swiftly to make sure that the rear was unmolested, saw the commander regarding his men in a highly resentful manner, as if he regretted above everything his association with them. The man at the youth's elbow was mumbling, as if to himself, Oh, we're in for it now. Oh, we're in for it now. The captain of the company had been pacing excitedly to and fro in the rear. He coaxed in schoolmistress fashion as to a congregation of boys with primers. His talk was an endless repetition. Reserve your fire, boys. Don't shoot till I tell you. Save your fire. Wait till they get up close. Don't be darned fools. Perspiration streamed down the youth's face which was soiled like that of a weeping urchin. He frequently, with a nervous movement, wiped his eyes with his coat sleeve. His mouth was still a little way open. He got the one glance at the foe swarming field in front of him and instantly ceased to debate the question of his piece being loaded. Before he was ready to begin, before he had announced to himself that he was about to fight, he threw the obedient, well-balanced rifle into position and fired a first wild shot. Directly, he was working at his weapon like an automatic affair. He suddenly lost concern for himself and forgot to look at a menacing fate. He became not a man, but a member.
He felt that something of which he was a part, a regiment, an army, a cause, or a country, was in a crisis. He was wielded into a common personality, which was dominated by a single desire. For some moments he could not flee. No more than a little finger can commit a revolution from a hand. If he had thought the regiment was about to be annihilated, perhaps he could have amputated himself from it. But its noise gave him assurance. The regiment was like a firework that, once ignited, proceeds superior to circumstances until it blazing vitality fades. It wheezed and banged with a mighty power. He pictured the ground before it as strewn with the discomfited. There was a consciousness always of the presence of his comrades about him. He felt the subtle battle, brotherhood, more potent even than the cause for which they were fighting. It was a mysterious fraternity born of the smoke and danger of death. He was at a task. He was like a carpenter who has made many boxes, making still another box. Only there was furious haste in his movements. He, in his thought, was careering off in other places. Even as the carpenter who, as he works, whistles and thinks of his friend or his enemy, his home or a saloon. And these jolted dreams were never perfect to him afterward, but remained a mass of blurred shapes. Presently, he began to feel the effects of the war atmosphere, a blistering sweat, a sensation that his eyeballs were about to crack like hot stones. A burning roar filled his ears. Following this came a red rage. He developed the acute aspiration of a pestered animal, a well-meaning cow worried by dogs. He had a mad feeling against his rifle, which could only be used against one life at a time. He wished to rush forward and strangle with his fingers. He craved a power that would enable him to make a world-sweeping gesture and brush all back. His impotency appeared to him and made his rage into that of a driven beast. Buried in the smoke of many rifles, his anger was directed not so much against the men whom he knew were rushing toward him as against the swirling battle phantoms which were choking him, stuffing their smoke robes down his parched throat. He fought frantically for respite for his senses, for air, as a babe being smothered attacks the deadly blankets. There was a blare of heated rage mingled with a certain expression of intentness on all faces. Many of the men were making low-toned noises with their mouths, and these subdued cheers, snarls, imprecations, prayers, made a wild barbaric song that went as an undercurrent of sound, strange and chant-like, with the resounding chords of the war march. The man at the youth's elbow was babbling. In it, there was something soft and tender, like the monologue of a babe. The tall soldier was swearing in a loud voice. From his lips came a black procession of curious oaths. Of a sudden, another broke out in a querulous way, like a man who has misled his hat. Well, why don't they support us? Why don't they send supports? Do they think? The youth in his battle sleep heard this as one who dozes hears. There was a singular absence of heroic poises. The men bending and surging in their haste and rage were in every impossible attitude. The steel ramrods clanged and clanked with incessant din as the men pounded them furiously into the hot rifle barrels. The flaps of the cartridge boxes were all unfastened and bobbed idiotically with each movement. 
The rifles, once loaded, were jerked to the shoulder and fired without apparent aim into the smoke or at one of the blurred and shifting forms which, upon the field before the regiment, had been growing larger and larger like puppets under a magician's hand. The officers, at their intervals, rearward neglected to stand in picturesque attitudes. They were bobbing to and fro for roaring directions and encouragements. The dimensions of their howls were extraordinary. They expended their lungs with prodigal wheels, and often they stood nearly upon their heads in their anxiety to observe the enemy on the other side of the tumbling smoke. The lieutenant of the youth's company had encountered a soldier who had fled screaming at the first volley of his comrades. Behind the lines, these two were acting a little isolated scene. The man was blubbering and staring with sheep-like eyes at the lieutenant, who had seized him by the collar and was pummeling him. He drove him back into the ranks with many blows. The soldier went mechanically, dully, with his animal-like eyes upon the officer. Perhaps there was to him a divinity expressed in the voice of the other, stern, hard, with no reflection of fear in it. He tried to reload his gun, but his shaking hands prevented. The lieutenant was obliged to assist him. The men dropped here and there like bundles. The captain of the youth's company had been killed in an early part of the action. His body lay stretched out in the position of a tired man resting. But upon his face there was an astonished and sorrowful look, as if he thought some friend had done him an ill turn. The babbling man was grazed by a shot that made the blood stream widely down his face. He clapped both hands to his head. Oh, he said, and ran. Another grunted suddenly, as if he had been struck by a club in the stomach. He sat down and gazed ruefully. In his eyes there was mute, indefinite reproach. Farther up the line, a man, standing behind a tree, had had his knee joint splintered by a ball. Immediately he had dropped his rifle and gripped the tree with both arms. And there he remained, clinging desperately and crying for assistance that he might withdraw his hold upon the tree. At last an exultant yell went along the quivering line. The firing dwindled from an uproar to a last vindictive popping. As the smoke slowly eddied away, the youth saw that the charge had been repulsed. The enemy were scattered into reluctant groups. He saw a man climb to the top of the fence, straddle the rail, and fire a parting shot. The waves had receded, leaving bits of dark debris upon the ground. Some in the regiment began to whoop frenziedly. Many were silent. Apparently, they were trying to contemplate themselves. After the fever had left his veins, the youth thought that at last he was going to suffocate. He became aware of the foul atmosphere in which he had been struggling. He was grimy and dripping like a laborer in a foundry. He grasped his canteen and took a long swallow of the warmed water. A sentence with variations went up and down the line. Well, we've held them back. We've held them back. Durned if we haven't, the men said it blissfully, leering at each other with dirty smiles. The youth turned to look behind him and off to the right and off to the left. He experienced the joy of a man who at last finds leisure in which to look about him. Underfoot there were a few ghastly forms motionless. They lay twisted in fantastic contortions. The arms were bent and heads were turned in incredible ways. It seemed that the dead men must have fallen from some great height to get into such positions. They looked to be dumped out upon the ground from the sky. From a position in the rear of the grove, a battery was throwing shells over it. 
The flash of the guns startled the youth at first. He thought they were aimed directly at him. Through the trees, he watched the black figures of the gunners as they worked swiftly and intensely. Their labor seemed a complicated thing. He wondered how they could remember its formula in the midst of confusion. The guns squatted in a row like savage chiefs. They argued with abrupt violence. There was a grim pow-pow. Their busy servants ran hither and thither. A small procession of wounded men were going drearily toward the rear. It was a flow of blood from the torn body of the brigade. To the right and to the left were the dark lines of other troops. Far in front, he thought he could see lighter masses protruding in points from the forest. They were suggestive of unnumbered thousands. Once he saw a tiny battery go dashing along the line of the horizon. The tiny riders were beating the tiny horses. From a sloping hill came the sound of cheerings and clashes. Smoke welled slowly through the leaves. Batteries were speaking with thunderous oratorical effort. Here and there were flags, the red in the stripes dominating. They splashed bits of warm color upon the dark lines of troops. The youth felt the old thrill at the sight of the emblem. They were like beautiful birds, strangely undaunted in a storm. As he listened to the din from the hillside to a deep pulsating thunder that came from afar to the left and to the lesser clamors which came from many directions, it occurred to him that they were fighting too, over there and over there and over there. Heretofore, he had supposed that all the battle was directly under his nose. As he gazed around him, the youth felt a flash of astonishment at the blue, pure sky, and the sun gleaming on the trees and fields. It was surprising that nature had gone tranquilly on with her golden process in the midst of so much devilment. Chapter 6 The youth awakened slowly. He came gradually back to a position from which he could regard himself. For moments he had been scrutinizing his person in a dazed way as if he had never before seen himself. Then he picked up his cap from the ground. He wriggled in his jacket to make a more comfortable fit and kneeling relaced his shoe. He thoughtfully mopped his reeking features. So it was all over at last. The supreme trial had been passed. The red formidable difficulties of war had been vanquished. He went into an ecstasy of self-satisfaction. He had the most delightful sensations of his life. Standing as if apart from himself, he viewed the last scene. He perceived that the man who had fought thus was magnificent. He felt that he was a fine fellow. He saw himself even with those ideals which he had considered as far beyond him. He smiled in deep gratification. Upon his fellows, he beamed tenderness and goodwill. Gee, ain't it hot, hey? He said affably to a man who was polishing his streaming face with his coat sleeves. You bet, said the other, grinning sociably. I never seen such dumb hotness. He sprawled out luxuriously on the ground. Gee, yes, and I hope we don't have no more fight until a week from Monday. Those were some handshakings and deep speeches with men whose features were familiar, but with whom the youth now felt the bonds of tied hearts. He helped a cursing comrade to bind up a wound of the shin. But all of a sudden, cries of amazement broke out along the ranks of the new regiment. Here they come again! Here they come again! The man who had sprawled upon the ground started up and said, Gosh! 
the youth turned quick eyes upon the field. He discerned forms begin to swell in masses out of a distant wood. He again saw the tilted flag speeding forward. The shells, which had ceased to trouble the regiment for a time, came swirling again and exploded in the grass or among the leaves of the trees. They looked to be strange war flowers bursting into fierce bloom. The men groaned. The luster faded from their eyes. Their smudged countenances now expressed a profound dejection. They moved their stiffened bodies slowly and watched in sullen mood the frantic approach of the enemy. The slaves toiling in the temple of this god began to feel rebellion at his harsh tasks. They fretted and complained each to each. Oh, say this is too much of a good thing. Why can't somebody send us support? We ain't never going to stand this second banging. I didn't come here to fight the whole darn rebel army. There was one who raised a doleful cry. I wish Bill Smithers had trod on my hand instead of me treading on his. And the sore joints of the regiment creaked as it painfully floundered into position to repulse. The youth stared. Surely, he thought, this impossible thing was not about to happen. He waited as if he expected the enemy to suddenly stop, apologize, and retire, bowing. It was all a mistake. But the firing began somewhere on the regimental line and ripped along in both directions. The level sheets of flame developed great clouds of smoke that tumbled and tossed in the mild wind near the ground for a moment and then rolled through the ranks as through a gate. The clouds were tinged an earth-like yellow in the sun rays and in the shadow were a sorry blue. The flag was sometimes eaten and lost in this mass of vapor, but more often it projected, sun-touched, resplendent. Into the youth's eyes there came a look that one can see in the orbs of a jaded horse. His neck was quivering with nervous weakness, and the muscles of his arms felt numb and bloodless. His hands, too, seemed large and awkward, as if he was wearing invisible mittens. And there was a great uncertainty about his knee joints. The words that comrades had uttered previously to the firing began to reoccur to him. Oh, say, this is too much of a good thing. Why do they take us for, why don't they send support? I didn't come here to fight the whole darned rebel army. He began to exaggerate the endurance, the skill, and the valor of those who were coming. Himself reeling from exhaustion, he was astonished beyond measure at such persistency. They must be machines of steel. It was very gloomy struggling against such affairs, wound up perhaps to fight until sundown. He slowly lifted his rifle and, catching a glimpse of the thick spread field, he blazed at a cantering cluster. He stopped then and began to peer as best he could through the smoke. He caught changing views of the ground covered with men who were all running like pursed imps and yelling. To the youth, it was an onslaught of redoubtable dragons. He became like the man who lost his legs at the approach of the red and green monster. He waited in a sort of a horrified listening attitude. He seemed to shut his eyes and wait to be gobbled. A man near him, who up to this time had been working feverishly at his rifle, suddenly stopped and ran with howls. A lad whose face had borne an expression of exalted courage, the majesty of he who dares give his life, was, at an instant, smitten abject. He blanched like one who has come to the edge of a cliff at midnight and is suddenly made aware. There was a revelation. He, too, threw down his gun and fled. There was no shame in his face. He ran like a rabbit. Others began to scamper away through the smoke. The youth turned his head. 
shaken from his trance by this movement as if the regiment was leaving him behind, he saw the few fleeting forms. He yelled then with fright and swung about. For a moment in the great clamor, he was like a proverbial chicken. He lost the direction of safety. Destruction threatened him from all points. Directly he began to speed toward the rear in great leaps. His rifle and cap were gone. His unbuttoned coat bulged in the wind. The flap of his cartridge box bobbed wildly, and his canteen, by its slender cord, swung out behind. On his face was the horror of those things which he imagined. The lieutenant sprang forward, bawling. The youth saw his features wrathfully red, and saw him make a dab with his sword. His one thought of the incident was that the lieutenant was a peculiar creature to feel interested in such matters upon this occasion. He ran like a blind man. Two or three times he fell down. Once he knocked his shoulder so heavily against a tree that he went headlong. Since he had turned his back upon the fight, his fears had been wondrously magnified. Death about to thrust him between the shoulder blades was far more dreadful than death about to smite him between the eyes. When he thought of it later, he conceived the impression that it is better to view the appalling than to be merely within hearing. The noises of the battle were like stones. He believed himself liable to be crushed. As he ran on, he mingled with others. He dimly saw men on his right and on his left, and he heard footsteps behind him. He thought that all the regiment was fleeing, pursued by these ominous crashes. In his flight, the sound of these following footsteps gave him his one meager relief. He felt vaguely that death must make a first choice of the men who were nearest. The initial morsels for the dragons would be then those who were following him. So he displayed the zeal of an insane sprinter in his purpose to keep them in the rear. There was a race. As he, leading, went across the little field, he found himself in a region of shells. They hurled over his head with long, wild screams. As he listened, he imagined them to have rows of cruel teeth that grinned at him. Once, one lit before him, and the livid lightning of the explosion effectually barred the way in his chosen direction. He groveled on the ground and then, springing up, went careering off through some bushes. He experienced a thrill of amazement when he came within view of a battery in action. The men there seemed to be in conventional moods, altogether unaware of the impending annihilation. The battery was disputing with a distant antagonist, and the gunners were wrapped in admiration of their shooting. They were continually bending in coaxing postures over the guns. They seemed to be patting them on the back and encouraging them with words. The guns, stolid and undaunted, spoke with dogged valor. The precise gunners were coolly enthusiastic. They lifted their eyes every chance to the smoke-wreathed hillock from whence the hostile battery addressed them. The youth pitied them as he ran. Methodical idiots, machine-like fools, the refined joy of planting shells in the midst of the other battery's formation would appear a little thing when the infantry came swooping out of the woods. The face of a youthful rider who was jerking his frantic horse with an abandon of temper he might display in a placid barnyard was impressed deeply upon his mind. He knew that he looked upon a man who would presently be dead. Too, he felt a pity for the guns standing, six good comrades in a bold row. He saw a brigade going to the relief of its pestered fellows. He scrambled upon a wee hill and watched it sweeping finely, keeping formation in difficult places. The blue of the line was crusted with steel color, and the brilliant flags projected. 
officers were shouting. This sight also filled him with wonder. The brigade was hurrying briskly to be gulped into the infernal mouths of the war god. What manner of men were they anyhow? Ah, it was some wondrous breed, or else they didn't comprehend the fools. The furious order caused commotion in the artillery. An officer on a bounding horse made maniacal motion with his arms. The teams went swinging up from the rear. The guns were whirled about, and the battery scampered away. The cannon, with their noses poked slantingly at the ground, grunted and grumbled like stout men, brave but with objections to hurry. The youth went on, moderating his pace, since he had left the place of noises. Later he came upon a general of division seated upon a horse that pricked its ears in an interested way at the battle. There was a great gleaming of yellow and patent leather about the saddle and bridle. The quiet man astride looked mouse-colored upon such a splendid charger. A jingling staff was galloping hither and thither. Sometimes the general was surrounded by horsemen, and at other times he was quite alone. He looked to be much harassed. He had the appearance of a businessman whose market is swinging up and down. The youth went slinking around this spot. He went as near as he dared trying to overhear words. Perhaps the general, unable to comprehend chaos, might call upon him for information. And he could tell him. He knew all concerning it. Of a surety the force was in a fix. And any fool could see that if they did not retreat while they had an opportunity, why? He felt that he would like to thrash the general, or at least approach and tell him in plain words exactly what he thought him to be. It was criminal to stay calmly in one spot and make no effort to stay destruction. He loitered in a fever of eagerness for the division commander to apply to him. As he warily moved about, he heard the general call out irritably, Tompkins, go over and see Taylor and tell him not to be in such an all-fired hurry. Tell him to halt his brigade and the edge of the woods. Tell him to detach a regiment. Say, I think the center will break if we don't help it out some. Tell him to hurry up. A slim youth on a fine chestnut horse caught these swift words from the mouth of his superior. He made his horse bound into a gallop almost from a walk into his haste to go upon his mission. There was a cloud of dust. A moment later, the youth saw the general bounce excitedly in his saddle. Yes, by heavens, they have, the officer leaned forward. His face was aflame with excitement. Yes, by heavens, they've held him. They've held him. He began to blithely roar at his staff. We'll wallop him now. We'll wallop him now. We got him sure. He turned suddenly upon an aide. Here, you, Jones, quick, right after Tompkins. See Taylor and tell him to go in everlastingly, like blazes, anything. As another officer sped his horse after the first messenger, the general beamed upon the earth like a sun. In his eyes was a desire to chant a beacon. He kept repeating, They've held him, by heavens! His excitement made his horse plunge, and he merrily kicked and swore at it. He held a little carnival of joy on horseback. Chapter 7 the youth cringed as if discovered in a crime. By heavens, they had won after all. The imbecile line had remained and become victors. He could hear cheering. He lifted himself upon his toes and looked in the direction of the fight. A yellow fog lay wallowing on the treetops. From beneath it came the clatter of musketry. Hoarse cries told of an advance. He turned away amazed and angry. 
He felt that he had been wronged. He had fled, he told himself, because annihilation approached. He had done a good part in saving himself. Who was a little piece of the army? He had considered the time, he said, to be one in which it was the duty of every little piece to rescue itself, if possible. Later, the officers could fit the little pieces together again and make a battle front. If none of the little pieces were wise enough to save themselves from the fury of death at such a time, why then, where would be the army? It was all plain that he had proceeded according to a very correct and commendable rules. His actions had been sagacious things. They had been full of strategy. They were the work of a master's legs. Thoughts of his comrades came to him. The brittle blue line had withstood the blows and won. He grew bitter over it. It seemed that the blind ignorance and stupidity of those little pieces had betrayed him. He had been overturned and crushed by their lack of sense in holding the position, when intelligent deliberation would have convinced them that it was impossible. He, the enlightened man who looks afar in the dark, had fled because of his superior perceptions and knowledge. He felt a great anger against his comrades. He knew it could be proved that they had been fools. He wondered what they would remark when later he appeared in camp. His mind heard howls of derision. Their destiny would not enable them to understand his sharper point of view. He began to pity himself acutely. He was ill-used. He was trodden beneath the feet of an iron injustice. He had proceeded with wisdom and from the most righteous motives under heaven's blue, only to be frustrated by hateful circumstances. A dull, animal-like rebellion against his fellows, war in the abstract, and fate grew within him. He shambled along with bowed head, his brain in a tumult of agony and despair. When he looked loweringly up, Quivering at each sound, his eyes had the expression of those of a criminal who thinks his guilt and his punishment great and knows that he can find no words. He went from the fields into a thick wood as if resolved to bury himself. He wished to get out of hearing of the cracking shots which were to him like voices. The ground was cluttered with vines and bushes, and the trees grew close and spread out like bouquets. He was obliged to force his way with much noise. The creepers, catching against his legs, cried out harshly as their sprays were torn from the barks of trees. The swishing saplings tried to make known his presence to the world. He could not conciliate the forest. As he made his way, it was always calling out protestations. When he separated embraces of trees and vines, the disturbed foliages waved their arms and turned their face leaves toward him. He dreaded lest these noisy motions and cries should bring men to look at him. So he went far, seeking dark and intricate places. After a time, the sound of musketry grew faint, and the cannon boomed in the distance. The sun, suddenly apparent, blazed among the trees. The insects were making rhythmical noises. They seemed to be grinding their teeth in unison. A woodpecker stuck its impudent head around the side of a tree. A bird flew on light-hearted wing. Off was the rumble of death. It seemed now that nature had no ears. This landscape gave him assurance. A fair field holding life. It was the religion of peace. It would die if its timid eyes were compelled to see blood. He conceived nature to be a woman with a deep aversion to tragedy. He threw a pine cone at a jovial squirrel, and he ran with chattering fear. High in a treetop, he stopped, and, poking his head cautiously from behind a branch, looked down with an air of trepidation. The youth felt triumphant at this exhibition. 
There was the law, he said. Nature had given him a sign. The squirrel, immediately upon recognizing danger, had taken to his legs without ado. He did not stand stolidly, bearing his furry belly to the missile, and die with an upward glance at the sympathetic heavens. On the contrary, he had fled as fast as his legs could carry him, and he was but an ordinary squirrel, too, doubtless, no philosopher of his race. The youth wended, feeling that nature was of his mind. She reinforced his argument with proofs that lived where the sun shone. Once he found himself almost into a swamp. He was obliged to walk upon bog tufts and watch his feet to keep from the oily mire. Pausing at one time to look about him, he saw, out at some black water, a small animal pounced in and emerged directly with a gleaming fish. The youth went again into the deep thickets. The brushed branches made a noise that drowned the sounds of cannon. He walked on, going from obscurity into promises of a greater obscurity. At length he reached a place where the high, arching boughs made a chapel. He softly pushed the green doors aside and entered. Pine needles were a gentle brown carpet. There was a religious half-light. Near the threshold, he stopped, horror-stricken at the sight of a thing. He was being looked at by a dead man who was seated with his back against a column-like tree. The corpse was dressed in a uniform that once had been blue, but was now faded to a melancholy shade of green. The eyes, staring at the youth, had changed to the dull hue to be seen on the side of a dead fish. The mouth was open. Its red had changed to an appalling yellow. Over the gray skin of the face ran little ants. One was trundling some sort of a bundle along the upper lip. The youth gave a shriek as he confronted the thing. He was for moments turned to stone before it. He remained staring into the liquid-looking eyes. The dead man and the living man exchanged a long look. Then the youth cautiously put one hand behind him and brought it against a tree. Leaning upon this, he retreated step by step with his face still toward the thing. He feared that if he turned his back, the body might spring up and stealthily pursue him. The branches, pushing against him, threatened to throw him over upon it. His unguided feet, too, caught aggravatingly in brambles, and with it all he received a subtle suggestion to touch the corpse. As he thought of his hand upon it, he shuddered profoundly. At last he burst the bonds which had fastened him to the spot and fled, unheeding the underbrush. He was pursued by a sight of the black ants swarming greedily upon the gray face and venturing horribly near to the eyes. After a time, he paused and, breathless and panting, listened. He imagined some strange voice would come from the dead throat and squawk after him in horrible menaces. The trees about the portals of the chapel moved soddingly in a soft wind. A sad silence was upon the little guarding edifice. Chapter 8 The trees began softly to sing a hymn of twilight. The sun sank until slanted bronze rays struck the forest. There was a lull in the noises of insects, as if they had bowed their beaks and were making a devotional pause. There was silence save for the chanted chorus of the trees. Then, upon this stillness, there suddenly broke a tremendous clangor of sounds. A crimson roar came from the distance. The youth stopped. He was transfixed by this terrific medley of all noises. It was as if worlds were being rended. There was the ripping sound of musketry and the breaking crash of artillery. His mind flew in all directions. He conceived the two armies to be at each other panther fashion. He listened for a time. Then he began to run in the direction of the battle. 
he saw that it was an ironical thing for him to be running thus toward that which he had been at such pains to avoid. But he said, in substance, to himself that if the earth and the moon were about to clash, many persons would doubtless plan to get upon the roofs to witness the collision. As he ran, he became aware that the forest had stopped its music, as if at last becoming capable of hearing the foreign sounds. The trees hushed and stood motionless. Everything seemed to be listening to the crackle and clatter and ear-shaking thunder. The chorus pealed over the still earth. It suddenly occurred to the youth that the fight in which he had been was, after all, but perfunctory popping. In the hearing of this present din, he was doubtful if he had seen real battle scenes. This uproar explained a celestial battle. It was tumbling hordes a struggle in the air. Reflecting, he saw a sort of humor in the point of view of himself and his fellows during the late encounter. They had taken themselves and the enemy very seriously and had imagined that they were deciding the war. Individuals must have supposed that they were cutting the letters of their names deep into everlasting tablets of brass or enshrining their reputations forever in the hearts of their countrymen. While, as to fact, the affair would appear in printed reports under a meek and immaterial title. But he saw that it was good, else, he said, in battle, everyone would surely run, save forlorn hopes and their irk. He went rapidly on. He wished to come to the edge of the forest that he might peer out. As he hastened, there passed through his mind pictures of stupendous conflicts. His accumulated thought upon such subjects was used to form scenes. The noise was as the voice of an eloquent being describing. Sometimes the brambles formed chains and tried to hold him back. Trees confronting him stretched out their arms and forbade him to pass. After this previous hostility, this new resistance of the forest filled him with a fine bitterness. It seemed that nature could not be quite ready to kill him. But he obstinately took roundabout ways, and presently he was where he could see all long gray walls of vapor, where lay battle lines. The voices of cannon shook him. The musketry sounded in long, irregular surges that played havoc with his ears. He stood regardant for a moment. His eyes had an awestruck expression. He gawked in the direction of the fight. Presently, he proceeded again on his forward way. The battle was like the grinding of an immense and terrible machine to him. Its complexities and powers, its grim processes, fascinated him. He must go close and see it produce corpses. He came to a fence and clambered over it. On the far side, the ground was littered with clothes and guns. A newspaper folded up lay in the dirt. A dead soldier was stretched with his face hidden in his arm. Farther off, there was a group of four or five corpses keeping mournful company. A hot sun had blazed upon the spot. In this place, the youth felt that he was an, an invader. This forgotten part of the battleground was owned by the dead men. And he hurried, in the vague appreciation that one of the swollen forms would rise and tell him to be gone. He came finally to a road from which he could see in the distance dark and agitated bodies of troops, smoke fringed. In the lane was a blood-stained crowd streaming to the rear. The wounded men were cursing, groaning, and wailing. In the air, always, was a mighty swell of sound that it seemed could sway the earth. With the courageous words of the artillery and the spiteful sentences of the musketry mingled red cheers. And from this region of noises came the steady current of the maimed. One of the wounded men had a shoe full of blood. He hopped like a schoolboy in a game. 
He was laughing hysterically. One was swearing that he had been shot in the arm through the commanding general's mismanagement of the army. One was marching with an air imitative of some sublime drum major. Upon his features was an unholy mixture of merriment and agony. As he marched, he sang a bit of doggerel in a high and quavering voice. Sing a song of victory, a pocket full of bullets, five and twenty dead men baked in a pie. Parts of the procession limped and staggered to this tune. Another had the gray seal of death already upon his face. His lips were curled in hard lines and his teeth were clenched. His hands were bloody from where he had passed them upon his wound. He seemed to be waiting the moment when he should pitch headlong. He stalked like the specter of a soldier, his eyes burning with the power of a stare into the unknown. There were some who proceeded sullenly, full of anger at their wounds, and ready to turn upon anything as an obscure cause. An officer was carried along by two privates. He was peevish. Don't joggle so, Johnson, you fool, he cried. Think me leg is made of iron? If you can't carry me decent, put me down and let someone else do it. He bellowed at the tottering crowd who blocked the quick march of his bearers. Say, make way there, can't you? Make way, Dickens, take it all. They sulkily parted and went to the roadsides. As he was carried to pass, they made pert remarks to him. When he raged in reply and threatened them, they told him to be darned. The so shoulder of one of the trampling bearers knocked heavenly against the spectral soldier who was staring into the unknown. The youth joined this crowd and marched along with it. The torn bodies expressed the awful machinery in which the men had been entangled. Orderlies and couriers occasionally broke through the throng in the roadway, scattering wounded men right and left, galloping on, followed by howls. The melancholy march was continually disturbed by the messengers and sometimes by bustling batteries that came swinging and thumping down upon them. The officers shouted orders to clear the way. There was a tattered man, fouled with dust, blood, and powder stained from hair to shoes, who trudged quietly at the youth's side. He was listening with eagerness and much humility to the lurid descriptions of a bearded sergeant. His lean features wore an expression of awe and admiration. He was like a listener in a country store to wondrous tales told among the sugar barrels. He eyed the storyteller with unspeakable wonder. His mouth was agape in yokel fashion. The sergeant, taking note of this, gave pause to his elaborate history while he administered a sardonic comment. Be careful, honey. You'll be a catching flies, he said. The tattered man shrank back, abashed. After a time, he began to sidle near to the youth and in a different way try to make him a friend. His voice was gentle as a girl's voice, and his eyes were pleading. The youth saw with surprise that the soldier had two wounds, one in the head, bound with a blood-soaked rag, and the other in the arm, making that member dangle like a broken bow. After they had walked together for some time, the tattered man mustered sufficient courage to speak. Was pretty good fight, wasn't it? He timidly said. The youth, deep in thought, glanced up at the bloody and grim figure with its lamb-like eyes. What? Was pretty good fight, won't it? Yes, said the youth shortly. He quickened his pace. But the other hobbled industriously after him. There was an air of apology in his manner, but he evidently thought that he needed only to talk for a time, and the youth would perceive that he was a good fellow. Was pretty good fight, wasn't it? He began in a small voice, and then he achieved the fortitude to continue. 
Durn me if I ever see fellers fight so. Laws, how they did fight. I know the boys like it when they once got square at it. The boys ain't had no fair chance up to now, but this time they showed what they was. I know to turn out this way. Yeah, I can't lick them boys. No, sir. They're fighters, they be. He breathed a deep breath of humble admiration. He had looked at the youth for encouragement several times. He received none, but gradually he seemed to get absorbed in his subject. I was talking cross pickets with the boy from Georgie on account of that boy. He sees your fellers are all run like heck when they once heard a gun, he says. Maybe they will, I says, but I don't believe none of it, I says, and I be Jiminy. I says back to him, maybe your fellers will all run like heck when they once heard a gun, I says. He larfed. Well, they didn't run today. They did, hey? No, sir. They fit and fit and fat. His homely face was sufficed with a light of love for the army, which was to him all things beautiful and powerful. After time, he turned to the youth. Where you hit, old boy? He asked in a brotherly tone. The youth felt instant panic at this question, although at first its full import was not borne in upon him. What? Where you hit? repeated the tattered man. Why? began the youth. I, I, that is, why, I. He turned away suddenly and slid through the crowd. His brow was heavily flushed and his fingers were picking nervously at one of his buttons. He bent his head and fastened his eyes studiously upon the button as if it were a little problem. The tattered man looked after him in astonishment. Chapter 10 The youth fell back in the procession until the tattered soldier was not in sight. Then he started to walk on with the others. But he was amid wounds. The mob of men was bleeding. Because of the tattered soldier's question, he now felt that his shame could be viewed. He was continually casting sidelong glances to see if the men were contemplating the letters of guilt he felt burned into his brow. At times he regarded the wounded soldiers in an envious way. He conceived persons with torn bodies to be peculiarly happy. He wished that he too had a wound, a red badge of courage. The spectral soldier was at his side like a stalking reproach. The man's eyes were still fixed in a stare into the unknown. His gray, appalling face had attracted attention in the crowd, and men, slowing to his dreary pace, were walking with him. They were discussing his plight, questioning him, and giving him advice. In a dogged way, he repelled them, signing to them to go on and leave him alone. The shadows of his face were deepening and his tight lips seemed holding in check the moan of great despair. There could be seen a certain stiffness in the movements of his body, as if he were taking infinite care not to arouse the passions of his wounds. As he went on, he seemed always looking for a place, like one who goes to choose a grave. Something in the gesture of the man as he waved the bloody and pitying soldiers away made the youth start as if bitten. He yelled in horror. Tottering forward, he laid a quivering hand upon the man's arm. As the latter slowly turned his wax-like features toward him, the youth screamed, God, Jim Conklin! The tall soldier made a little commonplace smile. Hello, Henry, he said. The youth swayed on his legs and glared strangely. He stuttered and stammered, Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! Oh, Jim! The tall soldier held out his gory hand. There was a curious red and black combination of new blood and old blood upon it. Where you been, Henry? he asked. He continued in a monotonous voice. I thought maybe you got killed over. 
there's been thunder to pay today. I was worrying about it a good deal. The youth still lamented. Oh, Jim. Oh, Jim. Oh, Jim. You know, said the tall soldier, I was out there. He made a careful gesture. And Lord, what a circus. And by Jiminy, I got shot. I got shot. Yes, by Jiminy, I got shot. He reiterated this fact in a bewildered way, as if he did not know how it came about. The youth put forth anxious arms to assist him, but the tall soldier went firmly on as if propelled. Since the youth's arrival as a guardian for his friend, the other wounded men had ceased to display much interest. They occupied themselves again in dragging their own tragedies toward the rear. Suddenly, as the two friends marched on, the tall soldier seemed to be overcome by a terror. His face turned to a semblance of gray paste. He clutched the youth's arm and looked all about him, as if dreading to be overheard. Then he began to speak in a shaking whisper. I tell you what I'm afraid of, Henry. I tell you what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid I'll fall down. And then, you know, them darned artillery wagons, they like as not will run over me. That's what I'm afraid of. The youth cried out to him hysterically. I'll take care of you, Jim. I'll take care of you. I swear to God I will. Sure, will you, Henry? The tall soldier, soldier beseeched. Yes, yes, I tell you. I'll take care of you, Jim, protested the youth. He could not speak accurately because of the gulpings in his throat. But the tall soldier continued to beg in a lowly way. He now hung babe-like in to the youth's arm. His eyes rolled in the wildness of his terror. I was always a good friend to you, won't I, Henry? I always been a pretty good feller, ain't I? And I ain't much to ask, is it? Just to pull me along out of the road? I'll do it for you, wouldn't I, Henry? He paused in piteous anxiety to await his friend's reply. The youth had reached an anguish where the sobs scorched him. He strove to express his loyalty, but he could only make fantastic gestures. However, the tall soldier seemed suddenly to forget all those fears. He became again the grim, stalking specter of a soldier. He went stonily forward. The youth wished his friend to lean upon him, but the other always shook his head and strangely protested. No, no, no. Leave me be. Leave me be. His look was fixed again upon the unknown. He moved with mysterious purpose, and all of the youth's offers he brushed aside. No, no. Leave me be. Leave me be. The youth had to follow. Presently, the latter heard a voice talking softly near his shoulders. Turning, he saw that it belonged to the tattered soldier. You'd better take um out of the road, partner. There's a battery coming. He'll be whoop down the road and he'll get to run over. He's a goner anyhow in about five minutes. You can see that. You'd better take him out of the road. Where the blazes does he get his strength from? Lord knows, cried the youth. He was shaking his hands helplessly. He ran forward presently and grasped the tall soldier by the arm. Jim, Jim, he coaxed, come with me. The tall soldier weakly tried to wrench himself free. Huh? He said vacantly. He stared at the youth for a moment. At last he spoke as if dimly comprehending. Oh, in, in the fields. Oh. He started blindly through the grass. The youth turned once to look at the lashing riders and jouncing guns of the battery. He was startled from this view by a shrill outcry from the tattered man. God, he's running! Turning his head swiftly, the youth saw his friend running in a staggering and stumbling way toward a little clump of bushes. 
His heart seemed to wrench itself almost free from his body at his sight. He made a noise of pain. He and the tattered man began a pursuit. There was a singular race. When he overtook the tall soldier, he began to plead with all the words he could find. Jim, Jim, what are you doing? What makes you do this way? You'll hurt yourself. The same purpose was in the tall soldier's face. He protested in a dulled way, keeping his eyes fastened on the mystic place of his intentions. No, no, don't take me. Leave me. Leave me be. The youth, aghast and filled with wonder at the tall soldier, began quaveringly to question him. Where are you going, Jim? What are you thinking about? Where are you going? Tell me, won't you, Jim? The tall soldier faced about as upon relentless pursuers. In his eyes there was a great appeal. Let me be, can't you? Let me be for a minute. The youth recoiled. Why, Jim, he said in a dazed way, what's the matter with you? The tall soldier turned and lurching dangerously went on. The youth and the tattered soldier followed, sneaking as if whipped, feeling unable to face the stricken man if he should again confront them. They began to have thoughts of a solemn ceremony. There was something right-like in these movements of the doomed soldier, and there was a resemblance in him to a devotee of a mad religion, blood-sucking, muscle-wrenching, bone-crushing. They were awed and afraid. They hung back, lest he have at command a dreadful weapon. At last they saw him stop and stand motionless. Hastening up, they perceived that his face wore an expression telling that he at last found the place for which he had struggled. His spare figure was erect. His bloody hands were quietly at his side. He was waiting with patience for something that he had come to meet. He was at the rendezvous. They paused and stood expectant. There was a silence. Finally, the chest of the doomed soldier began to heave with a strained motion. It increased in violence until it was as if an animal was within and was kicking and tumbling furiously to be free. The spectacle of gradual strangulation made the youth writhe, and once as his friend rolled his eyes, he saw something in them that made him sink wailing to the ground. He raised his voice in a last supreme call. Jim! 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 The tall soldier opened his lips and spoke. He made a gesture. Leave me be! Don't detect me! Leave me be! There was another silence while he waited. Suddenly his form stiffened and straightened. Then it was shaken by a prolonged ague. He stared into space. To the two watchers, there was a curious and profound dignity in the firm lines of his awful face. He was invaded by a creeping strangeness that slowly enveloped him. For a moment, the tremor of his legs caused him to dance a sort of hideous hornpipe. His arms beat wildly about his head in expression of imp-like enthusiasm. His tall figure stretched itself to its full height. There was a slight rending sound. Then it began to swing forward, slow and straight in the manner of a falling tree. A swift muscular contortion made the left shoulder strike the ground first. The body seemed to bounce a little way from the earth. God, said the tattered soldier. The youth had watched, spellbound, this ceremony at the place of meeting. His face had been twisted into an expression of every agony he had imagined for his friend. He now sprang to his feet and, going closer, gazed upon the paste-like face. The mouth was open and the teeth showed in a laugh. As the flap of the blue jacket fell away from the body, he could see that the side looked as if it had been chewed by wolves. The youth turned with sudden, livid rage toward the battlefield. He shook his fist. He seemed about to deliver a flippic. Heck, 
The red sun was pasted in the sky like a wafer. Chapter 10 The tattered man stood musing. Well, he was a regular Jim Dandy for nerve, wasn't he? said he finally in a little awestruck voice. A regular Jim Dandy. He thoughtfully poked one of the docile hands with his foot. I wonder where he got his strength from. I never seen a man do like that before. It was a funny thing. Well, he was a regular Jim Dandy. The youth desired to screech out his grief. He was stabbed, but his tongue lay dead in the tomb of his mouth. He threw himself again upon the ground and began to brood. The tattered man stood musing. Look a hair, partner, he said after a time. He regarded the corpse as he spoke. He's up and gone, ain't he? And we might as well be to look out for old number one. This here thing is all over. He's up and gone, ain't he? And he's all right here. Nobody won't bother him. And I must say I ain't enjoying any great health myself these days. The youth, awakened by the tattered soldier's tone, looked quickly up. He saw that he was swinging uncertainly on his legs and that his face had turned into a shade of blue. Good Lord, he cried, you ain't gone too, not you too. The tattered man waved his hand. Never die, he said. I wanted some pea soup and a good bed. Some pea soup, he repeated dreamfully. The youth arose from the ground. I wonder where he came from. I left him over there, he pointed, and now I find him here. And he was coming from over there too, he indicated a new direction. They both turned toward the body as if to ask it a question. Well, at length, spoke the tattered man, there ain't no use in our staying here and not trying to ask him anything. The youth nodded and assent wearily. They both turned to gaze for a moment at the corpse. The youth murmured something. Well, he was a Jim Dandy, wasn't he? said the tattered man as if in response. They turned their backs upon it and started away. For a time, they stole softly, treading with their toes. It remained laughing there in the grass. I commenced to feel pretty bad, said the tattered man, suddenly breaking one of his little silences. I commenced to feel pretty darn bad. The youth groaned. Oh, Lord, he wondered if he was to be the tortured witness of another grim encounter but his companion waved his hand reassuringly. Oh, I'm not going to die yet. There's too much depending on me for me to die yet. No, sir, ne'er die, I can't. You'd ought to see the swat of children I got and all and like that. The youth glancing at his companion could see by the shadow of a smile that he was making some kind of fun. As they plodded on, the tattered soldier continued to talk. Besides, if I died, I wouldn't die the way that feller did. That was the funniest thing. I'd just flop down, I would. I never seen a feller die the way that feller did. You know, Tom Jemison, he lives next door to me up home. He's a nice feller, he is, and we was always good friends. Smart, too. Smart as a steel trap. Well, when we was a-fighting this afternoon, all of a sudden he began to rip up and cuss and beller at me. You're shot, you blamed infernal. He swear horrible. He says to me, I put up my hand to my head, and when I was looked at him in my fingers, I seen, sure enough, I was shot. I give a holler and begin to run, but before I could get away, another hit me in the arm and whirled me clean round. I got scared when they was all a shooting behind me and I runt beat all, but I cotched it pretty bad. I have an idea I've been a fighting, yet if I 
If it weren't for Tom Jameson, then he made a calm announcement. There's two of them, little ones, but they're beginning to have fun with me now. I don't believe I can walk much further. They went slowly on in silence. You look pretty peaked yourself, said the tattered man at last. I bet you've got a worse one than you think. You'd better take care of your hurt. It don't do it. L let such things go. It might be inside mostly, and them's play thunder. Where is it located? But he continued his harangue without waiting for a reply. I see a feller get hit plumb in the head when my regiment was standing at ease, and everybody yelled out to him, Hurt, John? Are you hurt much? No, says he. He looked kind of surprised, and he went on telling him how he felt. He said he didn't feel nothing. But by that, the first thing that feller knowed, he was dead. Yes, he was dead, stone dead. So, yeah, want to watch out. You might have some queer kind of hurt yourself. You can't never tell. Where is your located? The boy had been wriggling since the introduction of this topic. He now gave a cry of exasperation and made a furious motion with his hand. Oh, don't bother me, he said. He was enraged against the tattered man and could have strangled him. His companions seemed ever to play intolerable parts. They were ever upraising the ghost of shame on the stick of their curiosity. He turned toward the tattered man as one at bay. Now don't bother me, he repeated with desperate menace. Well, Lord knows I don't want to bother anybody, said the other. There was a little accent of despair in his voice as he replied. Lord knows I got enough of my own to tend to. The youth, who had been holding a bitter debate with himself and casting glances of hatred and contempt at the tattered man, here spoke in a hard voice. Goodbye, he said. The tattered man looked at him in gaping amazement. Why, why, partner, where are you going? he asked unsteadily. The youth, looking at him, could see that he, too, like that other one, was beginning to act dumb and animal-like. His thoughts seemed to be floundering about in his head. Now, now, look a here, you Tom Jameson. Now I won't have this. This here won't do. Where, where are you going? The youth pointed vaguely. Over there, he replied. Well, now look, look a here now, said the tattered man, rambling on in idiot fashion. His head was hanging forward and his words were slurred. This thing won't do now, Tom Jameson. It won't do. I know you, you pig-headed devil. You want to go tromping off with a bad hurt. It ain't right now, Tom Jameson. It ain't. You want to leave me take care of you, Tom Jameson? It ain't right. It ain't. For you to go tromping off with a bad hurt. It ain't. Ain't. Ain't right. It ain't. In reply, the youth climbed a fence and started away. He could hear the tattered man bleeding plaintively. Once he faced about angrily. What? Look, look a here now, Tom Jameson. No, no, it ain't. The youth went on. Turning at a distance, he saw the tattered man wandering about helplessly in the field. He now thought that he wished he was dead. He believed that he envied those men whose bodies lay strewn over the grass of the fields and on the fallen leaves of the forest. The simple questions of the tattered man had been knife thrusts to him. They asserted a society that probes pitilessly at secrets until all is apparent. His late companion's chance persistency made him feel that he could not keep his crime concealed in his bosom. It was sure to be brought plain by one of those arrows which cloud the air and are constantly pricking, discovering, proclaiming those things which are willed to be forever hidden. He admitted that he could not defend himself against this agency. It was not within the power of vigilance. Chapter 
11. He became aware that the furnace roar of the battle was growing louder. Great brown clouds that floated to the still heights of air before him. The noise, too, was approaching. The woods filtered men and the fields became dotted. As he rounded a hillock, he perceived that the roadway was now a crying mass of wagons, teams, and men. From the heaving tangle issued exhortations, commands, imprecations. Fear was sweeping it all along. The cracking whips bit and horses plunged and tugged. The white-topped wagons strained and stumbled in their exertions like fat sheep. The youth felt comforted in a measure by this sight. They were all retreating. Perhaps then he was not so bad after all. He seated himself and watched the terror-stricken wagons. They fled like soft, ungainly animals. All the roars and lashers served to help him to magnify the dangers and horrors of the engagement, that he might try to prove to himself that the thing with which men could charge him was in truth a symmetrical act. There was an amount of pleasure to him in watching the wild march of this vindication. Presently, the calm head of a forward-going column of infantry appeared in the road. It came swiftly on. Avoiding the obstructions gave it the sinuous movement of a serpent. The men at the head butted mules with their musket stocks. They prodded teamsters indifferent to all howls. The men forced their way through parts of the dense mass by strength. The blunt head of the column pushed. The raving teamsters swore many strange oaths. The commands to make way had the ring of a great importance to them. The men were going forward to the heart of the din. They were to confront the eager rush of the enemy. They felt the pride of their onward movement when the reminder, remainder of the army seemed trying to dribble down this road. They tumbled teams about with a fine feeling that it was no matter so long as their column got to the front in time. This importance made their faces grave and stern, and the backs of the officers were very rigid. As the youth looked at them, the black weight of his woe returned to him. He felt that he was regarding a procession of chosen beings. The separation was as great to him as if they had marched with weapons of flame and banners of sunlight. He could never be like them. He could have wept in his longings. He searched about in his mind for an adequate malediction for the infinite cause, the thing upon which men turn the words of final blame. It, whatever it was, was responsible for him, he said, there lay the fault. The haste of the column to reach the battle seemed to the forlorn young man to be something much finer than stout fighting. Heroes, he thought, could find excuses in that long seething lane. They could retire with perfect self-respect and make excuses to the stars. He wondered what those men had eaten that they could be in such haste to force their way to grim chances of death. As he watched, his envy grew until he thought that he wished to change lives with one of them. He would have liked to have used a tremendous force, he said, throw off himself and become a better. Swift pictures of himself, apart yet in himself, came to him. A blue desperate figure leading lurid charges with one knee forward and a broken blade high. A blue determined figure standing before a crimson and steel assault. Getting calmly killed on a high place before the eyes of all. He thought of the magnificent pathos of his dead body. These thoughts uplifted him. He felt the quiver of war, desire. In his ears he heard the ring of victory. He knew the frenzy of a rapid, successful charge. The music of the trampling feet, the sharp voices, 
The clanging arms of the column near him made him soar on the red wings of war. For a few moments, he was sublime. He thought that he was about to start for the front. Indeed, he saw a picture of himself, dust-stained, haggard, panting, flying to the front at the proper moment to seize and throttle the dark, leering witch of calamity. Then the difficulties of the thing began to drag him. He hesitated, balancing awkwardly on one foot. He had no rifle. He could not fight with his hands, said he resentfully to his plan. Well, rifles could be had for the picking. They were extraordinarily profuse. Also, he continued, it would be a miracle if he found his regiment. Well, he could fight with any regiment. He started forward slowly. He stepped as if he expected to tread upon some explosive thing. Doubts and he were struggling. He would truly be a worm if any of his comrades should see him returning thus, the marks of his flight upon him. There was a reply that the intent fighters did not care for what happened, rearward saying being that no hostile bayonets appeared there. In the battle blur, his face would, in a way, be hidden, like the face of a cowled man. But then he said that his tireless fate would bring forth, when the strife lulled for a moment, a man to ask of him an explanation. In imagination, he felt the scrutiny of his companions as he painfully labored through some lies. Eventually, his courage expended itself upon these objections. The debates drained him of his fire. He was not cast down by this defeat of his plan, for upon studying the affair carefully, he could not but admit that the objections were very formidable. Furthermore, various ailments had begun to cry out. In their presence, he could not persist in flying high with the wings of war. They rendered it almost impossible for him to see himself in a heroic light. He tumbled headlong. He discovered that he had a scorching thirst. His face was so dry and grimy that he thought he could feel his skin crackle. Each bone of his body had an ache in it and seemingly threatened to break with each movement. His feet were like two sores. Also, his body was calling for food. It was more powerful than a direct hunger. There was a dull, weight-like feeling in his stomach, and when he tried to walk, his head swayed and he tottered. He could not see with distinctness. Small patches of green mist floated before his vision. While he had been tossed by many emotions, he had not been aware of ailments. Now they beset him and made clamor. As he was at last compelled to pay attention to them, his capacity for self-hate was multiplied. In despair, he declared that he was not like those others. He now conceded it to be impossible that he should ever become a hero. He was a craven loon. Those pictures of glory were piteous things. He groaned from his heart and went staggering off. A certain moth-like quality within him kept him in the vicinity of the battle. He had a great desire to see and to get news. He wished to know who was winning. He told himself that, despite his unprecedented suffering. He had never lost his greed for a victory, Yet, he said in a half-apologetic manner to his conscience, he could not but know that a defeat for the army this time might mean many favorable things for him. The blows of the enemy would splinter regiments into fragments. Thus, many men of courage, he considered, would be obliged to desert the colors and scurry like chickens. He would appear as one of them. They would be sullen brothers in distress, and he could then easily believe he had not run any further or faster than they. And if he himself could believe in his virtuous perfection, 
he conceived that there would be small trouble in convincing all others. He said, as if in excuse for this hope, that previously the army had encountered great defeats and in a few months had shaken off all blood and tradition of them, emerging as bright and valiant as a new one, thrusting out of sight the memory of disaster and appearing with the valor and confidence of unconquered legions. The shrilling voices of the people at home would pipe dismally for a time, but various generals were usually compelled to listen to these ditties. He, of course, felt no compunctions for proposing a general as a sacrifice. He could not tell who the chosen for the barbs might be, so he could censure no direct sympathy upon him. The people were afar, and he did not conceive public opinion to be accurate at long range. It was quite probable they would hit the wrong man who, after he had recovered from his amazement, would perhaps spend the rest of his days in writing replies to the songs of his alleged failure. It would be very unfortunate, no doubt, but in this case a general was of no consequence to the youth. In a defeat there would be a roundabout vindication of himself. He thought it would prove, in a manner, that he had fled early because of his superior powers of perception. A serious profit upon predicting a flood should be the first man to climb a tree. This would demonstrate that he was indeed a seer. A moral vindication was regarded by the youth as a very important thing. Without salve, he could not, he thought, wear the sore badge of his dishonor through life. With his heart continually assuring him that he was despicable, he could not exist without making it, through his actions, apparent to all men. If the army had gone gloriously on, he would be lost. If the din meant that now his army's flags were tilted forward, he was a condemned wretch. He would be compelled to doom himself to isolation. If the men were advancing, their indifferent feet were trampling upon his chances for a successful life. As these thoughts went rapidly through his mind, he turned upon them and tried to thrust them away. He denounced himself as a villain. He said that he was the most unutterably selfish man in existence. His mind pictured the soldiers who would place their defined bodies before the spear of the yelling battle fiend, and as he saw their dripping corpses on an imagined field, he said that he was their murderer. Again, he thought that he wished he was dead. He believed that he envied a corpse. Thinking of the slain, he achieved a great contempt for some of them, as if they were guilty for thus becoming lifeless. They might have been killed by lucky chances, he said before they had had opportunities to flee, or before they had been really tested. Yet they would receive laurels from tradition. He cried out bitterly that their crowns were stolen and their robes of glorious memories were shams. However, he said that it was a great pity he was not as they. A defeat of the army had suggested itself to him as a means of escape from the consequences of his fall. He considered now, however, that it was useless to think of such a possibility. His education had been that success for that mighty blue machine was certain, that it would make victories as a contrivance turns out buttons. He presently discarded all his speculations in the other direction. He returned to the creed of soldiers. When he perceived again that it was not possible for the army to be defeated, he tried to bethink him of a fine tale which he could take back to his regiment, and with it turn the expected shafts of derision. But as he mortally feared these shafts, it became impossible for him to invent a tale he felt he could trust. He experimented with many schemes, but threw them aside one by one as flimsy. He was quick to see vulnerable places in them all. 
Furthermore, he was much afraid that some arrow of scorn might lay him mentally low before he could raise his protecting tail. He imagined the whole regiment saying, Where's Henry Fleming? He run, didn't he? Oh, my. He recalled various persons who would be quite sure to leave him no peace about it. They would doubtless question him with sneers and laugh at his stammering hesitation. In the next engagement, they would try to keep watch of him to discover when he would run. Wherever he went in camp, he would encounter insolent and lingeringly cruel stares. As he imagined himself passing near a crowd of comrades, he could hear some one say, There he goes! Then as if the heads were moved by one muscle, all the faces were turned toward him with wide, derisive grins. He seemed to hear someone make a humorous remark in a low tone. At it, the others all crowed and cackled. He was a slang phrase.